Welcome to the PI World Thursday webinar on the 2nd of July 2020. I'm your host, Tamsin Freeman, and today I'm delighted to be joined by David Thornton, who is editor of Growth Company Investor. David, thanks so much for joining us. Can you tell us a bit about your background? Well, th thanks for inviting me, uh, Tamsin, and um, very pleased to be here. Um, the slide there shows that I have uh, 38 years experience, which makes me feel uh, feel very old. Um, I think the first point to make is that I've, I've always been a, an equity investor. All my experience has been in equities, most of it in the, uh, in the UK. Um, but I did spend four years doing the US market uh, during my time at Henderson, which is where I spent uh, most of my career. And then I had a, a, a midlife crisis and uh, left to start up a, an Eastern European fund at a, a West End boutique, which I did for six years, uh, doing Russia and Turkey, Poland and so on. So um, quite a wide ranging uh, equity experience, but, but all equities. Um, and then um, after my uh, Eastern Europe uh, uh, foray ended, um, I moved into writing about investment rather than doing it uh, in an institutional context uh, i've been doing that for the last seven years and thoroughly enjoying it in the last uh, five years i've been editor of uh, growth company investor can you tell us a little bit about growth company investor yeah uh, i mean it's it's sadly it's not quite as well known as, as as i'd like it to be um it actually started it's got quite a long provenance it started in i think in the 90s um, mainly sort of news oriented at that time, but it, it, it's moved into being a, a monthly uh, digital magazine, e-magazine. Uh, goes out on the last Friday of, um, of, of every month uh, in a, a PDF form. Um, it looks pretty good uh, on an iPad, uh, but obviously you could, you could print it off if, uh, if you like a, a hard copy. Um, I do about eight and a half thousand words every, every month, um, three main stocks as a uh, recommendation write-ups uh, there's always a feature piece this cover you see here is from may where i wrote about um, income stocks and dividends in the in, in the wake of uh, all those uh, cancellations and uh, deferrals we were getting um, during the results season to uh, to uh, dividends post covid uh, the, the 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 one which went out at the end of last week i wrote about um direct customer billing. I've, I've spoken to uh, both uh, Bango and Boku during the uh, uh, during the month. So I did a feature piece on, on direct company, uh, direct uh, customer billing uh, in, in the mobile sector. So there's a feature piece on, on different things. I also write about um, 19 other stocks each month. That's an outlook bit. And also um, I set up shortly after I, I took, took it on um, a portfolio uh, for a bit of fun. Um, and uh, so there's always a, a portfolio update. And uh, I remember the first six or seven months or so, it was pretty moribund. I think I was down about three or four percent. Um, but then uh, the last last few years, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's done a lot better. So it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's quite a wide ranging um, look at, at smaller companies, AIM and uh, the uh, listed sector of uh, small caps. And um, and obviously it's uh, it's paid for. Uh, I've got a a deal at the end that uh, I, I can offer listeners to the webinar and we'll hopefully um, show that later on. But also, I think we were interested in just having a quick poll, um, just just really to see what proportion of the, um, of, the of the audience out there actually pays for uh, pays for ideas. Um, there's so much free stuff around at the moment. Um, you know, I'm obviously quite interested as a as the editor of a, a, a newsletter, uh, how many people actually pay and and how many don't. So we've got the poll up at the moment. And if you could complete that to say, do you pay for ideas? That would be a newsletter, a magazine or a website. And we've got 92% do actually pay for ideas and 80% right. don't. So that's, that's pretty impressive. That is, yeah, and that's very, uh, that's a good turnout. So valid, uh, a valid sample and, um, and, and and very encouraging. Um, you know, there is an awful lot. Of, I mean, it's, if I go back to eighty two when I started, I mean, the big thing that's changed has been, um, you know, the the amount of information out there that's readily available to people is is quite phenomenal now. But that's that's very encouraging. We've got another poll, which is, do you pay for tools? 
So we'll just launch that. And if you could complete that and tell us if you pay for tools. Yeah, I mean, this is more sort of academic interest for me because obviously the the big platforms most people use like uh, AJ Bell or, or Hargreaves Lansdowne and, uh, and so on. I mean, they do provide quite a lot of stuff, um, you know, charts and information on, on stocks uh, uh, for free as part of the package. So I was just interested to to know. I mean, I find personally, I find I I, I uh, subscribe to both um, ShareScope and, and Stockopedia and, and ShareScope in particular, I found absolutely invaluable. And um, later on, when I talk about stocks, um, just to give them an acknowledgement, it's acknowledged under the charts, but I use their, uh, their charts in the, in the presentation. And we've got 81% that do pay for tools and 19% who don't. So that again okay. is quite Great. interesting. Pretty serious audience. So I need to, uh, <laughs> need to obviously make sure I put my name down today. So right. why do you like small caps? Well, I, I, I suspect I'm, I'm, you know, pushing on an open door here and in in, in this is an audience that probably likes as well. But I think that, that the, the, the table on, um, on this slide really explains why anybody would like uh, small caps and, and there are two or three quite important things to, to, to bring out on this um, and this looks at uh, 65 years of, re of returns so even older than I am um, and I, th I think the first um, observation is the uh, the power of, uh, of compounding over such a long period uh, the first column there shows inflation which is averaged 5.2 I think it's 5.22 percent per annum uh, over this period, obviously huge fluctuations in that, but that's been the average inflation rate. Um, so if you were to buy uh, a basket of goods uh, today, which would have cost £100 in 1955, you will need over 2,700 quid. Um, and that just gives you a, a sense of what 5% per annum does over that long period. Now, to preserve your purchasing power an excellent thing to have done would have been to invest in, in equities and the next column shows that the um well it's, it's I, I say all share there that it's, it's basically the uk uk market um uh, return has been uh 11 and a half percent per annum now that's six 6.3 percent per annum real return over that uh, that period um i think coincidentally that's that's roughly that's six percent real is roughly what uh, equities gave you over the whole sweep of the 20th century. So it's uh, it's, a, it's 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 been a pretty pretty consistent, uh, healthy return. Uh, and as you see, not only would have it uh, preserved your purchasing power, it would have also given you quite a lot more uh, in your uh, in, in your account. Um, but to do a little bit better, you'd have fo uh, focused on smaller caps and the new miss small companies index looks at the bottom 10 percent of the market by value and that outperformed the all share uh, by 3.3 percent a year over this period doesn't sound a huge amount 3.3 percent a year but the magic of compounding um that would have uh, given you three over three quarters of a million pounds rather than 118,000. now if you were really smart back in 55 and you'd have gone for uh, what here is called the NSCI 1000, which is the bottom 2% of the market by value, you'd have had an extra million quid in your, in your, in your back pocket. Um, it, and that's just an extra 1.5% per annum compounded over 65 years. Uh, would have turned £100 into £1.8 million. So, yeah, equities are marvellous and small companies are even more marvellous. The one key message though as well I want to get over from this slide particularly for people tuning in who, who might well, they're lucky enough they're in their early 20s or they may have uh, teenage children or you know children at university something like that please 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 start investing as early as you possibly can um, this just shows you know the impact of allowing your money to compound over time um, so yeah I think that's a key key message to uh, to get over here just want to take a couple of seconds um, on the reasons why small companies might have done quite so well uh, we get an excess return to equities to compensate us for volatility or risk 
um, according to the academics. And the academics would also say that the excess return of smaller companies over re uh, larger stocks is a reward for illiquidity, uh, for the fact that these things are harder to trade in and, and, and you tend to be locked in a little bit uh, longer. And I think there's probably something in that. Uh, academics would deny the next point about information advantage because they would say the market is efficient. But I think we all know it isn't really, in particular as we get into smaller companies, you, you can get an information advantage which helps drive those uh, those excess uh, excess returns. And the final point I would make is that private investors, and having been a, an institutional investor for, for, for most of my, my career, um, private investors do have an advantage. Um, we can um, cope with illiquidity and we can hold stocks for long periods of time. We don't have to make quarterly reports or monthly reports and so on. So I think we all have an advantage when it comes to smaller caps and uh, yeah, it's important to, to use it. So, so it's pretty easy really, you just buy small caps and hold them for a long time. Or do you? Let's, let's quickly look at the next slide. Um, uh, this is just a point I want to make is that is that timing uh, is is very important. Um, I think it's a bit of a fallacy that if you you know if, if you hold something for long enough, then you get bailed out by uh, by time, and and that if your entry point is isn't quite you know as good as you'd like, yeah, if you just hold it, you'll be bailed out. I do think you have to think a lot about valuation and getting uh, getting into stocks and getting into the market at a at a sensible level. Um, you know, one thing has always struck me that uh, stuck with me is that if you bought at the top of the uh, US bull market in 1929, just before the crash, it took you, I think, over 25 years to get back to where you started in real terms. You know, it was in mid to late 50s for you to recoup your money in real terms. So uh, timing is important. Uh, and those stunning small cap returns that we saw um, were discovered by a couple of academics who um, launched the index. It was then the Horgavet Small Companies Index in 1987. And um, it, it, having discovered the holy grail, um, if you piled in then, you probably had a 10 or 12 years of, of pretty bad underperformance. Um, at the start of this period, in 55, small companies were extremely cheap. I mean, they, the index yielded 9%. Um, by the time they launched it, Small companies had gone to a premium. They were trading on a P ratio of about 20% higher than the, the average UK stock. So, you know, you've got to be you've got to be canny and, and a little bit careful of, of, of valuation and, and, and when you get on board. Um, where are we now? Well, well, none of us are very sure because obviously guidance has been suspended. Um, but at the start of this year, uh, the little table at the bottom there shows that actually um, small caps look to, to my eyes at least to be pretty good value um, you know 15 multiple on the um, 10 bottom 10 percent and uh, even cheaper at the bottom uh, two percent and that's based on companies which which reported uh, which reported earnings so it doesn't include uh, it doesn't include loss makers um, so yeah not a bad time now to be investing in smaller companies uh, Xing out uh, COVID. I just want to start talking a little bit about how I think about uh, investment in the market, uh, and also just really picking up on a you know a related issue to the one I, I spoke about last uh, in the last slide. Um, yeah, absolutely true. Isn't there? Stop picking is paramount in small caps. Most of the returns that we get from a small company are specific to that uh, to that stock. Um, and you know, less of it is down to the general market background. But as I've just said, the general market background, will particularly when we get to extreme levels of valuation, um, does does tend to take over. Um, but I also think that, that sort of factors and themes are important things to think about as well uh, when we're looking at small companies. And it does strike me the last two, three, four years, there's been a, something of a love-in, as I call it there, with... Uh, good companies with quality growth stocks, um, and as you can see, those are the those are just the top seven um, companies in AIM by market cap, um, excluding uh, Hutchison, China Meditech, and Dart, where the earnings uh, don't have uh, earnings at the moment or, or don't, on reporting earnings. Uh, and those are some pretty eye-watering uh, multiples, which make me worry a little bit. Um, and I'm contrasting that 
with uh, half a dozen or so uh, more cyclical companies, economically sensitive companies, uh, which um, clearly are suffering badly at the moment, um, but um, you know, will recover at, at, at some point. And we, we, I think we need to form a view on recovery. The multiples I put there are based on last year's earnings. So those are current share prices divided by historic earnings. Um, I would point out that I don't think 2019 was a particular banner year for the UK economy. Um, and I would have expected ex-COVID some decent growth over the next couple of years. Um, so those aren't peak earnings power multiples. So I, 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 I just strikes me the elastic is getting a little bit stretched here. And I'm, I'm probably more interested generally uh, uh, thinking about recovery and looking for opportunities in that area going forward than I would be saying, oh, well, gosh, um, Boohoo's a great company. I'll, I'll have a few more on a 55 multiple. So uh, I, as I said, think about valuation. I also like to think about um, you know, any thematic uh, factors, but in the context that, as I said, you know, small caps uh, really is all about uh, stock specifics. Uh, and we'll be looking at uh, a few stock specifics in a in a second. But um, perhaps we move on to the next slide. I'll just uh, give you a feel for what I look for on a stock specific basis. And I've, I've kept this deliberately um, simple and, uh, and and general. Um, in a nutshell, it's growth at a reasonable price. Um, I like to find what I think are pretty good companies. Uh, which I think are doing reasonably well and have got scope to improve or carry on doing well, but which are not valued perhaps as highly as I think they could be. Um, so as a result of that, I hope to get the rewards from the growth they deliver, uh, but also I expect to see or hope to see uh, those to be turbocharged by a, a re-rating. So I get a double whammy of reasonable growth and a bit of a re-rating as well. Um, that's the sort of thing that I'm, I'm looking for. As you might have guessed from the previous slide, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of, of paying very high ratings. And I've always struggled a bit with out-and-out value, out value plays. Um, I've occasionally get tempted into something which looks dirt cheap, but it, it doesn't, doesn't often work out for me. So I'm a bit wary of perhaps those two extremes. Um, but I'm also flexible. I, I do envy people who have a, a very disciplined, rigid process. Uh, you know, they've got the tick boxes and it's got to pass all the all the tests to to get in the portfolio. Um, I've, I've, I've always liked to be flexible because I, you know, I just just rarely see um, that perfect pitch in Warren Buffett terms or the uh, the market doesn't always serve up juicy half volleys outside the off stump. So uh, I, I, you have to be a bit flexible. And finally, I also put in their um, story. Now, you know, nowadays I'm, I'm a, a journalist, so stories are, are important to me. And it's what I spend uh, a, a fair part of my, my month uh, sort of producing. But it, it's also, I find, simple, straightforward, propositions work very well in, in an investment um, in the investment world anything that's overly complex complicated difficult to explain hard to get across um, they don't often they don't don't often work I find so I, I I really like ideas that you know I can I can you know pitch to a mate in the pub over a pint you know in three or four minutes um, or something that I can scribble down in a couple of paragraphs. Um, you know, those those things tend to be ones that I I, I like, and, and and over the years seem to be the one you know the, the ideas that, um, that that really uh, generate the returns. So, so what stock picks do you have for us? Everyone wants to know. The first one I've I've chosen to put in is is, is Venture Life, which um, I hold in the Great company investor portfolio. Put it in um, a, a few months back. Um, it's a company which has its its main asset is a, a very large factory in northern Italy. Actually, it's, it's Lombardy. I mean, it's right right in the heart of, um, of, of where those um, uh, where, where the huge uh, COVID outbreak was uh, in in northern Italy. But they happily 
uh, they handled that. I've spoken to management um, uh, since um, that they handled that exceptionally well. So the factory was was never closed, and they moved to two shifts and 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 you know just managed it extremely well. Then they got this very big factory in northern Italy, which uh, manufactures uh, personal uh, personal care products. Um, it, it's quite a range of uh, of healthcare products that it makes. It's it's got a quite quite a strong position in. Uh, medicated uh, mouthwash and uh, ultra dex i think you you may see if you look out for it in all in in boots and so on and dentals uh, uh, another one those are brands which uh, the company owns um and they've grown a, a branded portfolio by really acquiring uh, neglected products um healthcare products which are owned by large companies or other companies who've um you know not really focused on them and they've been able to pick them up for very low uh, valuations and, um, and and hopefully work them work the brands a lot a lot harder I think it's a fairly you know, familiar model it's not not reinventing it's not it's not inventing the wheel it's uh, it's, it's just really copying sort of strategies a lot of um, other firms have done in in, in branded uh, branded goods they also do a lot of contract manufacturing as well um, I mean for example they've got a a relationship with Alliance Pharma, which is another um, listed stock that I follow, and that's uh, announced a recent extension to uh, uh, to that. Um, they're also quite entrepreneurial. They move very quickly into producing um, hand sanitizer, and uh, that's actually going to be looks like it's going to be a very profitable uh, profitable line for them. Um, as I say, they're, they're growing the branded portfolio. And brands obviously carry um, higher margins than than contract manufacturing. Um, but a lot of the story is is also operational gearing as they they, they build build up their production at the this factory. I think at the moment they're producing in the low twenty million uh, units. I think about twenty five uh, going to twenty five twenty seven million something like that. Um, they can expand capacity up to forty odd million units. I think with just about a million million and a half. Of capex and and the the footprint they have there can go up to uh, I think seventy million units of, um, of of output. So they can you know, they can come close to sort of trebling their um, the, the, their output uh, from their existing uh, business with relatively modest uh, increases in in capex. So there's a lot of uh, potential there. Operational gearing as you leverage that overhead. And I also put in their margin mix, and, and clearly we're, we're seeing um, increasing content from uh, own brand uh, products as well. Um, I spoke to them. I first spoke to them actually um, four years ago, and the the strategy is, has been very consistent since then. Um, and I first wrote them up as a main recommendation in GCI, pretty much actually at the beginning of this chart, which was the, the beginning of um, of 2019. And as you can see, the stock. Uh, didn't do very much at all, um, and then actually had a bit of a slump because they had uh, some problems with product they were shipping to China, which 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 got got resolved. Um, but this year has been a, a very different story, as you can see, and the, the stocks have absolutely gone through the roof. And when I spoke to Jerry Randall, who's the CEO, a few months ago, I mean, it was pretty pretty clear that brokers' forecasts were way behind um, what the outturn was likely to be. And um, you know we've had upgrades this year from 2.7p to to over 5p. Um, I think consensus is around about six and a half p for next year, and I, I, I think there's still scope for those numbers to be meaningfully meaningfully upgraded. Um, and the company's got cash on hand, so it can continue to grow by picking up. Uh, uh, brands or uh, making corporate acquisitions. It made its first corporate acquisition um, earlier this year of a, a Dutch business, uh, which is why the um, uh, why the, de the, the net cash dips uh, dips this year. But it's inherently cash generative, so it's very very nice business. You, you know, very clear uh, view on how it's going to grow, and for the sort of growth rates it's achieving. I mean, fifty percent this year. The majority of that will be organic. I mean, the, the, the business they bought is about two or three million uh, of sales. Uh, for that to be trading on 15 and a half times, I think is just simply too low. And I, I think we're going to get further upgrades. So uh, no reason why this can't trade on a high teens multiple, in my view. So it's a classic go up stock. Um, yeah, it's reasonably valued at the moment. It's growing very nicely. And there's lots of reasons why it should get uh, re-rated. 
uh, which will give us a double whammy. You know, if it gets to say 18 times uh, um, next year's earnings, well, that's that's fifty uh, percent on the share price, even even without getting uh, upgrades. So we have had a question that's come in on that that you could perhaps quickly cover off from Miles yes. Ruffle, who says venture life looks cheap on the surface, but returns on capital have been consistently poor. Any reason for that? Well, the the, the the historic numbers won't look great. I, I mentioned I didn't um, write about them for a couple of years after I first spoke to them because they were uh, barely making any profits. Um, it's taken them time to, you know, grow the top line um, and uh, you know deliver, well, move into move into profitability, um, which they've they've unequivocally achieved this year. So. Going forward, we're going to see, um, you know, significant, in, you know, improvements in return on return on capital, um, and uh, you know, so I think that, I think the, the forward-looking numbers will be a lot healthier than the the historic. And I think there's, a, there's also don't want to bang on here, but there is a, also a point I would make about smaller companies in general. And, and I talked to an, as you saw on the previous slide, I, I talked to an awful lot of companies, and they all have great plans, and you've just got to get your timing right because quite often it just takes them longer to deliver uh, than than management hope things get delayed and take time to come through and so on and i think that's there's been a, a sense here with with venture life that um a lot of these building blocks were in place 12 months ago 18 months ago but it's only just now that it's all you know all the uh, the, the, the planets are aligning and everything is is, is going well the next one is is acrol so i suppose staying in the in the personal care uh, space. Um, Acrol uh, makes uh, toilet tissue uh, is the uh, polite uh, description. Um, it's 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 got a fifty percent uh, share of the UK private label um, toilet roll market, um, which is a, a pretty chunky position to be in. Um, and private label uh, supermarket private label is about half of the total market. Um, you know, the rest of it's sort of branded. Andrex, I guess, will probably be the, the market leader. But the the, the private label uh, segment is taking share from, from branded. Um, so the overall market predictably grows at um, population growth rate. Um, but private label is growing at 8% uh, at the moment. Um, this last year, the company will have done uh, about 11% uh, top buying, which is you know, pretty consistent uh, Consistent with that. Um, now, if you look at the chart, well, two things to say. First of all, I would say that's a lovely chart, <laughs> really nice, nice uptrend. Um, but you can see something rather dramatic happened in 2017, 2018, and the, um, the old management um, got into problems. Uh, there was too much debt. Um, they they weren't really controlling costs as well as they needed to be. Um, particularly, I think they had some FX hedging contracts uh, blow up on them, and um, basically the, the business was nearly lost, as you can see by the, uh, the share price move. But um, new management uh, came in. Um, they did a uh, an equity raise, and um, actually, I think there's a pretty pretty chunky uh, spend on on restructuring uh, big restructuring charge um, and, a, and a turnaround is being being executed and as you can see from the chart there you know they're clearly getting getting back on track and the point on debt I mean I, I included that as a line in the the table there um, it peaked at about 34 million um, in uh, the April 18 year and then came down to 27 that was helped by the equity raise i think the we haven't had the full results yet for 2020 but the, the sales number and the net debt number are, are good they're accurate numbers so that 17.9 is is two or three million better i think than people were expecting um so they're ahead of the game on debt i did adjust down the 21 and 22 debt numbers basically with a finger in the air but i suspect those numbers there are too pessimistic i I, I would expect when we get the full numbers out and we can do some proper analysis, I, I guess they're going to be bringing the debt number down a lot, you know, a lot faster than uh, than that. Um, uh, the turnarounds being led by 
Um, Gareth Jenkins is a, a CEO. I mean, he spent 24 years at uh, DS Smith, um, a company actually. I remember he used to meeting a lot in the he used to meet a lot in the 1990s. It was David S. Smith, lower reaches of the mid cap, but it's now a, now a FTSE, a FTSE company. Um, and um, one quote actually I wrote down uh, when I, I last spoke to him. Uh, I really appealed in the context of the industry they're in. I mean, he said, you know, you just have to have a ruthless and relentless approach to efficiency. And I thought ruthless and relentless. I rather, rather, rather liked, rather appealed to me. Um, but I think the story, you know, is 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 about a bit more than that. I mean, they don't want to just stop at making toilet roll and kitchen roll. Um, they're looking to develop more value-added uh, products within the same within the same sort of uh, tissue competence. Uh, but I would also uh, expect to see some M&A. I mean, they want to be running a, big, a bigger business, basically. So I, I think we're going to see as, as the debt comes down um, and the story gets more credibility, the share price continues to improve. I would expect to see, um, I'd expect to see some, some acquisition activity uh, along the way. And, you know, if we do get that, uh, and those earnings numbers are a little bit on the conservative side, then, you know, I think it, it continues to look like a like a going up share, which is is, is what it certainly has done so far in the last uh, last year or two. Codemasters, which I again, this 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 really this has really appealed to me as a, as a GARP uh, type per uh, type story. Uh, Codemasters, a uh, video game publisher, and we all know video games are. Uh, it's a great growing industry anyway, and it's had a, a, a further shove uh, in the right direction, uh, courtesy of, of lockdown. Uh, Codemasters is a is sort of leading publisher of, uh, of racing games. It, it sort of focuses on the motor racing sort of genre, and its its major leading property is is, is F1, which is licensed from the uh, from Formula One uh, rights owners, which is Liberty Media in the US, and they've just extended the license deal there to out to 2025. So um, we don't need to worry about any issues on that for, for, for quite some time. There are other uh, games, a grid, Dirt Rally, and I think actually they've done a deal with World Rally um, um, uh, Championship as well um, to, to, to title, do a title there. Project Cars, came in with the SMS acquisition, which I made at the end of December. And SMS also brought um, a game which has been developed um, in conjunction with the owners of the uh, Fast and Furious film uh, franchise. Um, and that's due to be launched uh, next month in uh, in August. Um, so a, a, a decent range of, um, of, of games there. It's not uh, dependent on on, on, on one title, though obviously F1 is, um, is, 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 is pretty important. Um, there are a cu couple of other things as well, which I think we can look to see, look to for upgrades. And one is um, the shift to digital sales. I mean, just as music has gone from CDs manufactured, packaged and sold through retail stores, so video games uh, are now being distributed digitally. Um, the gross margins on those are, are a lot higher as a, as, as a result. Uh, last year, um, I think uh, Codemasters went from 59% to 69% of sales by the digital channel. So they'll continue upwards and that'll be a tailwind. Um, games as a service, um, uh, that is relates to the their ability to sell games uh, via a subscription model and also to sell um, add-on uh, modules and uh, extra um, e extra elements to a game uh, once it's already been bought. And, and again, the digital channel really does lend itself to that. Um, it's doing, it's, that starts to go quite well for them with, um, I think, the, uh, the Dirt Rally title. Um, but um, the, the sort of service type revenues from F1, I think, are, are tiny. I think they're in about 3% of the, the revenue they, they've been getting from F1. Uh, so they feel they're, they've been a little bit behind the curve there. So we, we should expect to see a, a really nice push uh, from, from the uh, Games as a Service initiative over the next few years. And they've also got to tie it with um, a, a, a business in uh, China that's using the um, engine to uh, write uh, mobile 
um, racing games. Um, and so that's potential upside for Codemasters as, uh, as well. Um, the stock had a difficult period after the IPO. Um, and this shows uh, when it came to the market in, in uh, 18. Um, it, it, it had a, a game which um, slightly disappointed uh, that I think hurt sentiment. Um, but since then, we've seen a you know quite a bit of a vol bit of volatility on the chart, but basically a nice a nice uptrend. And and coming from a coming from a position of really quite a big discount to the uh, to the industry, and, and that discount's really still in place. It's on twenty times current year's earnings. Um, you know, team seventeen trades on thirty four. Onto developments uh, 45 times when even keyword studios which is, is an outsourcer rather than a company which owns uh, ip that uh, trades on 30 times um as i said i think there is scope for upgrades here again because of some of the factors i spoke about and also i noticed a note from uh, Shaw capital came out yesterday which has actually got earnings uh, in 22 up on 21 so um you know that that would drop the multiple you know into the in, in, into the high teens, so um, yeah, they very much like this one as a, as a sort of classic uh, GARP story. You've got the earnings per share there dropping in 2022, as flagged by Keith Jones. You're not bothered about that, or is there a reason for that? Well, I, one of the one of the things you've got to be looking out for with uh, video game companies, publishers, is their release schedule. And uh, you know, some years there may be two games, new games come out. Other years, three games, and then if next year's a two-game year, you inevitably get uh, some volatility. And I, I think that really shows up if you look at frontier developments. Uh, and that can make it a little bit difficult to, you know, to, to get a handle on. You've just got to accept it as being part of the, uh, uh, as being the nature of the beast. But as I said, I've just just actually pulled up the the Shaw note which came out yesterday and they have earnings that they've got 16.9 p in for um for the current year which is a bit better than i'm showing in the table there so that's good uh, and then they've got 18 p for uh the the 22 year which drops the multiple to 19 so um i think those numbers might be a bit pessimistic but it, it, it does very much relate to release schedules and and, and so on uh, but one of the actually before i leave this one of the nice things about codemasters is that it, it's these, these are enduring games played by real hardcore enthusiasts uh the nice thing about f1 is that there's a new version every year and the others tend to be every sort of two to three years. So it's just really understanding the release schedule. Great. Uh, we're going to have to really scuttle through the next ones because we're running short of time. OK, I'll, I'll cut one of them then. But we'll do the next one, which is um, AFH finance, Financial. I'll try and do this fairly quickly. Again, it's a GARP story. Um, AFH Financial is an IFA uh, network. Um, and the really the business model here is that um, they've got a, a, a well-invested uh, IT platform where compliance, regulation, support, and, and, and so on for um, independent financial advisors. Um, there are an awful lot of small IFA firms out there, and it makes sense in a lot of cases for them to sell their business to an AFH financial. Uh, forget about all the, uh, the, the, the hassles of running their business and coping with uh, never-ending compliance demands and um and focus on looking after their clients um uh, so there's a bit of a sort of private to public valuation arbitrage by buying these uh these these companies um but there's also a a um uh, an operational gearing effect as, as you as you as you bung them onto the onto onto the network um the business is inherently cash generative and you have good recurring revenues these are it's well it's wealth management it's uh um it, it's 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 client focused rather than being uh for management focused so uh, you get good good visible recurring uh, revenues um so it's a consolidator um it's peers sell on mid teens multiples the likes of brooks mcdonald and so on um and you know here we've got to stop trading on just over 10 times dropping to just over nine times it's just it's just too cheap why is it cheap it's got a bit of debt and the market i think in this sector doesn't really like debt very much and it's kind of been battling with that on the one hand it wants to acquire companies and, and grow because it sees great opportunity but it's got to manage this this debt issue and and, and on hudson understands that and he's uh, you know they're very much focused on 
organic growth um you know over the next period to to just pay down the debt from the cash generation and, and that should help the the rating on the uh, on the stock so I, I think it's you know we've got a couple of things going for us we've got some nice growth it's in a growing sector um and uh, and it's on a, a very very appealing rating in the interest of time i might quickly skip over my next slide which is manalay they've got results out tomorrow i'll be talking to the management tomorrow um um but uh, it's an interest very interesting situation but i'll i'll skip over that because i wanted to just do a a, a recovery name um and um i picked victoria i spoke to uh, Jeff Wilding uh, last week um, after their uh, trading update. Um, you know, Victoria is a floorings company. Um, it's it's quite well spread now. It's got about ten percent of its business in Australia, about a quarter of it in uh, the UK, where it does mainly carpets. It also does underlay and and and, and ancillaries and stuff. Um, and then uh, getting on for two thirds now is in Europe, where it has uh, ceramic tile uh, plants in. Uh, Italy and, uh, and, and and Spain. Um, I mean, it's been a bit controversial in, in that it, it went up a lot. Uh, he did a lot of great deals and improved returns, managed the business really well, and then overstretched a little bit in terms of um, uh, acquisitions. Uh, not in terms of um, the the performance of the acquisitions, but in terms of the the debt taken on to uh, to acquire them. So it got quite a hefty D rating and the market started to worry about the debt uh, in the middle of middle of last year. And then of course we've gone into uh, COVID and stocks been been absolutely smashed. Uh, it's a stock I did own in the GCI portfolio. I sold it and and I actually, you know, be thinking of putting it back in there because um, you know, particularly having spoken to him last week, I mean his 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 words were he's you know, a lot more optimistic than he was back in March. Um, the last three months during lockdown and, and so on, they've they've managed to hold the line on cash. The cash position has been relatively stable because they've, um, you know, they've got a very high proportion of variable costs. Um, and, you know, this business should come back pretty quickly, I think. Um, the profit numbers we've got in there, uh, as I said, I put a question mark next to the debt forecasts because uh, those are based on old notes and I, I, I don't really have an up-to-date uh, sense of how the debt is going to come down but um, you know essentially this is a stock on um, probably you know if, if things come back pretty quickly it's probably on a, a, a multiple nearer five than, than, than seven you know looking out a year in a year or two um, just very very cheap and um, and I think quite quite interesting and it kind of looks to me as well like the stock has, has, has bottomed out uh, i think it's actually trading up quite a bit higher than it was when i did the uh, did this uh, did this chart um, a couple of days ago great so let's open up for a few questions i've got two questions on afh one from miles ruffle who says on what multiple of assets under management do they sell and how does that compare to others Ooh, um, right. Um, I don't. I, I don't off the top of my head have the have have that number. Um, it's it's like a. I, I think it's a bit. It can be a bit of a blunt instrument because you've got to look at the you know the well, the margins that you make on 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 the uh, on the assets um, and the quality and sustainability and and so on um and you know you, you've got in other words you've got to put, put it in context um but i to be perfectly frank i do, just don't have the number off, off the top of my head so I, i'm afraid i can't answer that at the moment but I'll, I'll um so paul hawkins asks also on afh does the integration risk and contingent commitments of previous purchases worry you um no um it's a good very good question um the uh, the contingent part. I mean, typically um, you 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 buy you buy the business uh, on a, a two year two year earn out. Um, you're effectively using the uh, you know the cash generated by the businesses you're buying to to buy them. Uh, so if if they if they disappoint um, or there's an issue, then um, you know obviously you don't you don't have to pay the full 
contingent consideration. So that is, uh, you know, that, that, that offsets your risk is why, why you have deferreds in the, in the first place. It is a very good point, though, about integration. And I know that, um, you know, from speaking to the management here, uh, they have um, just just refined um, the sort of businesses that they're that, that they're looking to buy. Um, uh, you know, as a result, and I, ideally, you know, they want um, uh, they they want they want businesses where which are effectively run by the you know the IFAs themselves who who have the clients and are going to stay with the business. Uh, and, and look after clients and um, you know that's r rather than you know a team that's going to want to sort of cash out as it were so um, but yeah I mean you're, you're I mean it's a, it's, it's, it's a crucial question because it is a consolidation play but the, the balance sheet as I say I'm 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 pretty pretty comfortable about and you know management know they can't issue shares down at these levels they can't issue more debt so we're going to see those are those deferred considerations fade away uh, over the next two or three years and, and the debt come down quite nicely, which I think will help with the re-rating. Great. And Robert Thornton asks on Venture Life, on the PE on SharePad is 38. Is this considered good value? Right. OK. Uh, I mean, that might be that might be the historic um, number. Um, I I. I, yeah, I, I don't. It's not. That's not something I recognise. That might be a historic. Uh, that might be a historic number. I'm. I'm very comfortable with the. Um, you know, the earnings in the in the slide there, and on, on the slide that we showed. Um, you know, which. Uh, you know, have the st have the stock on a, a mid teens multiple. So. Um, um, yeah, I, I think the, the point here is that with any any bought in service like that, the numbers. I mean, I know people like Sharepad, Stockopedia. You know, try and clean up. Uh, the data and they'll have their own particular criteria they use to define earnings per share um you, you've kind of got to sit down yourself and figure out what they've done to the numbers relate them to what the company's reported and and you know do your own adjustments because it, it could it could it could have be impacted by uh amortization of acquired intangibles for example which is not something i would want to take off um take off a, an earnings number and Jay Shaw asks, what's your views on Amiga Diagnostics and Elicosoft, if you have any? Amiga Diagnostics, my word. Well, I, 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 I first spoke to them, I don't know, about, probably about seven years ago, six, seven years ago. Uh, I mean, Amiga has been all, had been, pre-COVID, had been all about getting their um, Visitec uh, test for AIDS uh, up and running. Um, which um, you know potentially is a very exciting uh, prospect. It is, it's essentially it's a point of care test, so it doesn't have to go off to a lab. It's um, it's just a pinprick of blood on a on a little plastic cartridge with flow, and, it, and the line will either turn the right colour or not to tell you whether you, you know, about your, the viral load in in AIDS and when you should start to go on to um, um, uh, retrovir and all the other antiviral drugs. Um, and because it's a point of care test, potentially great in the third world, Africa, India, and, and, and so on. And it's just taken them an awfully long time to get that thing uh, robust enough to work. But it's finally being rolled out now, uh, which is which is very very positive. Um, it's been overtaken by their involvement in a consortium, UK consortium, to develop um, user manufacturing technology of these point of care tests. To develop a similar. A similar test for for COVID, and the shares have gone up a lot. I think as a as a result of that, and I think they've also raised a bit of money as well, which is very sensible in the, in the circumstances. Um, I'm I'm a little bit little bit wary of um, you know of of the outlook um, as we go, particularly with this and some of the other sort of COVID type plays in terms of um, you know will will the hopes be realised? Uh, will the business this element of the business be, you know, sustained um, as as the virus hopefully uh, hopefully fades. Um, so it's if if you hold it and you held it at low levels, extremely well done. Uh, I'd probably be tempted to to take a little bit of profit at the moment. The other one I think you mentioned was Illico, um, which is um, uh, yeah. I mean, this is a, this is an interesting company. Um, it, it, it it's it focuses now on um it's always been in the building sector it focuses now on on software for construction uh companies architects and so on it's got a very full sort of full suite of software which 
can take you through from sort of planning and and some sort of stuff architects would use through to actually managing buildings, but particularly in estimation and and and, and so on. Um, and it's uh, it, it it looks pretty decent value. The what what I've been looking to try and get a sense of from from my conversations with them is that the, the whole business is coming together as a as a single brand and really being pushed forward because it, it's it's got they've got a Swedish business a German business and a UK business and my impression was historically it had been quite quite siloed and they were really you know um, you weren't hitting the ball as far as they could in terms of um, you know being a, a coherent group and cross selling and, and so on um, so I I just like to get a bit of a better sense of that. It's, it's a very sound business, I think, and at these levels, it's perfectly, perfectly good. Um, I think it could be better. So it's, it's, you know, it's quite an interesting one. It's what I've been thinking of doing a, you know, full write up on in, in in GCI, to be honest. So yeah. And Richard Waller asks: Are you concerned about the decline in AIM numbers, and do you see any hope that new flotations of new companies might start to increase? I'm, I'm actually quite delighted in the decline of AIM numbers to a degree. I, when I first started um, uh, writing, uh, I, I, I was doing something called Red Hot Penny Shares, which is a name, as it says on the tin, was uh, looking at more of the racier end of AIM. And I used to joke that having just been managing a, a fund uh, aimed at uh, focused on, on Russia and Turkey was actually quite good practice for looking at governance and so on in the lower reaches of AIM. Um, we've weeded out a lot of um, a lot of the dross, to be honest. I think I think seven or eight years ago, AIM probably well, probably about eleven hundred companies on AIM, and we're now down at about eight hundred, uh, maybe even dips just dipped a little bit below that. So I think we've we've weeded out a lot of the uh, companies which really shouldn't shouldn't have been listed, and the the general quality, the average quality, has has improved a lot. And uh, I find myself um, talking to far fewer. Um, you know, uh, unimpressive companies, and you know, I, I, I'm I'm very encouraged that the the quality, almost like you know the old old '60s TV series, wasn't it? Never mind the quality, feel the width. Well, the width has narrowed, but the quality's gone up here. Um, in terms of um, new issues, yes, you know, I I am a bit concerned that we're not really seeing very many new issues at all. What we are seeing is pretty good um so again the quality things are good but it, yeah i mean it is a bit of a concern uh, there is a general issue um even you know for the main market about companies coming um private equity seems to be a uh, you know quite a quite a big counter attraction for uh, for vendors of businesses um you know, do, you, do you go public with all the scrutiny and the costs involved with that or you know do you, do you go to a private equity house and uh you know, which is a different approach. And I think um, it seems to be PE seems to be uh, winning out at the moment. So I guess longer term, it's an issue. Short term, as I say, it's been good in terms of improving the quality on AIM. And Mark Atkinson asks, do you generally wait for companies to reach profitability before investing or will you consider those still gaining traction? I did say earlier on that flexibility is, you know, is is important because you can say, and I think it's perfectly valid to say, I'm, I'm only going to invest in companies that are profitable. I'm only going to invest in companies that pay dividends, for example. I, I, I think I think being flexible is is a good thing. Um, I have tried to uh, speak on a personal level. Um, I have tried to uh, reduce uh, my uh, temptation of getting into speculative situations and uh, pre-revenue stocks and so on. Um, I do I do write about the occasional pre-revenue company and so on. And I, I wrote about Creo Medical in the recent um, GCI, which uh, is on the verge of, uh, of, of going becoming commercial business. Um, proper commercial business, um, main, partly to educate people. I mean, it was a new name for me. Very, very interesting story. 300 odd million market cap, which tells you there's something interesting behind that. But it's not yet, um, so not profitable and certainly I'm not, I'm not really making much in the way of, of revenues, but they're about to. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't put anybody off, um, you know, buying into an earlier stage company. I would just say, don't don't do too many of them. Um, and try and stay very close to them and, and, and on top of how they're progressing. And if they're hitting their milestones, 
um, then you know you, you, you can actually you know you can actually do very well in those situations. And if you can give your answer quickly, um, James Coulson asks about Manalay. Are you concerned about Manalay's recent update relating to a big claim having to go to court? Um, I'll, I'll find out more about this tomorrow when I speak to Steve Cooklin. Um, I mean, essentially, they had um, they had some larger claims which unusually went to court. And most of their cases uh, are settled before uh, they go to court, um, and that's one of the big attractions of the, of, of, of the model here. Um, you know, most of the cases settle in under a year, and and they don't go to court. Um, and you know that makes it very different to something like a, a Burford, for example. We got much longer times time frames, far fewer cases. I mean, there's there's a big caseload here as well, so it's quite well spread. Um, and I think the cases referred to in the uh, the recent update, um, you know, were split out because they were unusually unusually large, um, and and obviously could have moved the moved the needle had they um, you know had they gone the right way. Um, but I think the what, what I what I take comfort with with Manila is that it, it does not rely on a you know a single case or a, or a handful of cases. Um, it, it, it it's almost like a sort of a sausage uh, machine. You know you um, you put the cases in one end and they they come out the other within a year. And there's been a, a really significant uptick in the uh, and it's more than an uptick. <laughs> it's, it's more it's a, a doubling of caseloads taken on so far this year. Um, and the growth uh, in the second half of last year was extremely strong as well, which leads me to think those forecast numbers, which are a bit historic now, I think they're from a November note from Peel Hunt. Um, my sense is those numbers will be, uh, the profit numbers should be a lot higher over the next couple of years, given the growth in the caseload. So, um, so I think it's an interesting business, but we will know a lot more about it um, tomorrow uh, when, they, when they report. David, where can people find you? And can you tell us a bit more about the offer you've mentioned? Well, if you send me an email at david.thornton at bonhill.com, uh, then I'd be delighted to send you a free trial copy of the magazine. No obligation. And we'll also send a, a form uh, where you can apply for a discounted subscription. Uh, we'll offer 10% off the normal price. So 12 months for £120 and uh, a free copy to have a look at. Uh, so send me an email mentioning the uh, PI World Seminar and um, your name, and uh, we'll get that to you. It's david.thornton at bonhillplc.com. Great. David, thanks very much for a superb webinar. Really appreciate it. My, uh, my pleasure. Really enjoyed it and uh, hope, uh, hope listeners found it interesting. I'm sure they have. Next week, 9th of July, there will be no PI World webinar. However, on the 16th of July at one o'clock, we are delighted to be joined by Andy Bruff, who, as most of you will know, is head of the UK and European small and mid cap team at Schroeder's. So that's worth making a date in your diary. If you want an email notification of webinars or events PI World are organising, go to the right hand side of the homepage at piworld.co.uk. UK. There are two boxes. The top, sign up for notification of a new video as it's published and underneath, sign up for events. Different list, no spam. And please do tell your investing friends about PI World and write comments or like our videos on Twitter, bulletin boards and YouTube. We also produce all the videos as a podcast, so do write reviews on iTunes. We'd like to go on providing these free webinars and getting really good speakers relies on you and the audience numbers we attract. So if you have ideas of speakers, do email me or message me. You can find me through the contact page on PI World or on Twitter at Tams in PI World. Many thanks to you all for joining us and stay well and goodbye for now. <laughs>